He's talking about things that are both happening in his time. Like you mentioned King Artaxerxes at one point in our uh, chapter tonight, when that had nothing to do with what was talked about with Zerubbabel and Joshua. So a little confusing, I get that. But um, uh, it's still important that as we're talking about these things, we're trying to kind of pin down when everything is, is going on and what it is that we have going on. Before we go any further tonight, let's uh, take a second. Let's go to our Father and we're prayer. Would you join me? <laughs> Most holy God and Father in heaven, we give thanks. You blessed us with a few minutes of time tonight to come before, uh, to break open your word, Father, and to examine the things that are given to us, Father, and help us to, as we look at these events so long ago, to see uh, how it is that there is a pattern of behavior and trust in you that we can learn from, Father. Watch over us through the remainder of this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, remind ourselves, where were we, God? The book of Israel, the book of Nehemiah. We're talking about the time when the Israelites, having been taken away into captivity. Why were they taken into captivity? They didn't obey God. They disobeyed God. God had promised them, way back in Deuteronomy, that if they didn't obey him, that they would lose everything. The covenant would be broken, they'd be cast out, they would be people that were then uh, uh, without the promises of God. And, of course, uh, that still meant they were obligated to the law of Moses. That's why they're doing the things they're doing. But they no longer have the promises of God. What were the promises of the law of Moses? Of the covenant of Moses, maybe I'll say? The land. The land. Yes. And not just that they have the land or are in the land, but that the land would be fruitful and they would be safe from their enemies. And so now that they've come back to the land, which is kind of a tricky question for you, is the promise coming back to them to come back to the land? No, very good, it's not. Because it's not theirs anymore. Because what they have done to break that covenant, unbreaks them, except by one. Christ, yes, Jesus will actually not restore their covenant, but bring about, what does the Hebrew writer call it? A, a better covenant, yes, a new covenant, the, the New Testament. Um, we want to kind of pin all that down, though, just to understand where we're at in the story of the scheme of redemption. Israel, the covenant's broken. They're in default. They've come back, though, not all of them, just a few, and they're trying to restore the worship of God by restoring the temple. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but I want you to kind of think about this, the importance of the temple. Why does the temple matter? What's important about the temple? Uh, why don't you kind of put a few things in your mind uh, as we talk about those things here in just a few minutes? Because one of the things that's important to understand here is that the Bible tells us that these things happen to them. First Corinthians chapter 10 says, these things happen to them. It's examples for us. And like the Hebrew writer says, these things, many of them are foreshadows of things that we're thinking about today. So that's the importance. So go ahead, uh, as we look here in chapter 6, uh, can somebody read for me? Um, let's just go ahead and read what happens here at chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 6, 1 and 2. Lord, go ahead. Making Darius a secure decree, and a search was made in the archive for the treasures were stored in Babylon. In an act of that, the palace had in the province of Media, a scroll was found, and in it, a record was written thus. So, you know, of course, remember how it was. The governor of the region had uh, said, hey, you know, the, these people are collecting things and they're building things. And, and one of the things he's thinking about is that they're collecting lots of big timbers and, you know, lots of stonework. Uh, what, you know, making the governor a little nervous. What kind of things could you build with big timbers and stones and stuff? Yes. You know what I think is interesting is when I think of the temple, I think also that that could be a fortress. So I think absolutely that's a little bit of what he's thinking about, you know, he's worried about. So he says, now these people say that Cyrus permitted them to do this. So, you know, being reasonable, at least it seems, that back in chapter 5, verse 17, he asked the king, well, you know, why don't you look around, look through Babylon, and see if this is true or not. So they look around, and do they find the find this order in Babylon? <laughs> no. Now, this is interesting. I told you uh, a few weeks ago, Persia actually had four capitals. Ibana and Persepolis and uh, uh, Susa and Babylon. So Babylon's one of the four capitals. So is this other place. Uh, 
uh, that we uh, get referenced here. What's really interesting is I, you know, I wondered why they looked even. I don't know about you, but you know, uh, I've never found bureaucracy particularly effective in saying, you know, I know I sent this letter to you guys, and the IRS said, oh, well, Brian, we're going to search all the records, and we're, we're going to go to different offices looking for it. I think it's fascinating to think about the idea that there's there's this question about these things, and they're looking around. What do you think about that? What do you think, Stephen? Yeah, that's what I think it is. I think somehow or other, we're getting a little hint about something providential, because they don't just find it in Babylon. They don't even find it in the province of Mesopotamia. They find it in the province of Medea, which today, you know, this is over in the area of Iran now. So they don't even find it nearby. They find it at a completely different location. Now, let's say that uh, King Darius had pulled this up and he'd looked at it. He said, I don't like this decree. Uh, I'm going to just uh, veto it. Is there a problem with that? What do we know about the laws of Persians? You know, that's an interesting thing about the Persians. And we find that out in the book of Daniel where it talks about the, uh, the laws that they make. They didn't allow for a law to be revoked. Okay? Now, sometimes you could have that, the supplemental law put on top of it, but it didn't allow for a law to be revoked. Now, you think anything in the New Testament kind of has a similar statement like that? That's kind of a stretch of the imagination. But maybe Paul talking about something in the book of Galatians. He says, you know, chapter 3, once these things are set up, even if they're just the things of men, none, none can annul or change them. Do you remember that conversation? He's talking about covenants. So it's kind of interesting that what we're describing here, perhaps, is that the Persians saw law like a covenant. That they didn't believe that it could be taken away. So the interesting point here to consider is that uh, uh, that you know the law was there, and a previous king having said it, the next king could not be the one to dismiss it. Anybody have any thoughts about that? So they, uh, as they as they go through here, they read. Um, actually, would somebody go ahead and read verses three, three, four, and five? Well, we learned, but that's a good question. Do you oh. know how many years passed between these two? Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of interesting, Ryan. Uh, um, so we know what's, what we kind of pointed out before was that Cyrus to Darius wasn't a smooth transition. There was actually a war and, a, you know, some, uh, there was, if I recall, there was something about somebody claimed to be a son of Cyrus. They didn't think he really was. And they called him the pretender. And they had a big war about this. So there was some confusion at that time. But honestly, not a lot of time. Not a lot of time passed. So it's not as though, you know, everybody forgot about Cyrus. I suspect, Ryan, that this probably just wasn't that important to a lot of people. You know, uh, I, I mentioned before, Jerusalem really isn't that important to the town. Um, and, of course, Jerusalem destroyed is even much less important. The only thing that Jerusalem had going for it was it was between uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt. So if you need to get there, this is the way you went. Yeah, don't share my Bible. It says that... The the journey from Jerusalem to Babylonia was eight months. And then, so they are just, they're, they're just kind of, that's the problem. If they're saying that this process probably took about a year to just search. You know, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. I think it actually, they're pulling the eight months from the journey, the time that Ezra uh, takes to get there. So I think they may be pretty, uh, uh, pretty good because in chapter seven, it gives us the time that he did the journey. Um, Oh, so in chapter, chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's interesting that, you know, we just don't appreciate the idea of, you know, send them an email. Hopefully, I get the answer this afternoon. Um, we're talking about a long process of these things going on. So, uh, which is pretty typical. Pretty typical. Uh, Ryan, would you like to read? I already picked you, so you're stuck. Uh, 3, 2, 5. Uh, yeah, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. The first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offer sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be firmly laid, its height 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits, with three rows of heavy stones in one row of new timber. Let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury, and also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the, temp from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and brought back to Babylon, 
be restored and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its own, each to its place, and deposit them in the house of God. So uh, the governor is real concerned what there were there were these stones and timbers being collected, and you know he never uses that term, but I was thinking exactly like now that and you know I've been worried about them building a fortress, a place to withstand a siege, or things like that. But what does it actually tell us the answer to that question is? Well, what did the what did the letter that Cyrus had tell us about those things? Well, as he talks about these things, he's telling us pretty clearly that all of this was about rebuilding the house of God. He said there in verse 4, uh, to re let the house be rebuilt from the place that they offered sacrifices. Now, he'll go on to add to that to talk about the things that they're going to be setting up. But the important point to think about is the idea that it's become clear. Go ahead. Let's think about, um, kind of going back to that, that what they're worried about. Um, later on in Nehemiah, remember, you, you know, whenever there's conspiracy against Nehemiah, one of his buddies suggests that he go into the temple, lock it up, and yeah. use it as a fortress. Yeah, that's right. So it's not an <laughs> unfounded thought that they couldn't be building something. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Uh, uh, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's right. In the book of Nehemiah, we'll see them suggest to Nehemiah to hold himself up in there. So that's a good point. I know the, uh, if it's 60 cubits by 60 cubits, is that 18 inches a cubit? So that's, I assume so. Yeah. That's actually pretty small. Yeah. 90 feet by 90 feet. Yeah. That's um, feet kind of strange that it says also on its old foundation. We talked about them laying the foundations, but it sounds like what it's just saying is right on top of the spot where the old one was. But 60 cubits by uh, height and width of 60 cubits. So 90 feet tall, um, nine stories. I mean, it's not bad. But, you know, the, the width, you know, of 90 feet kind of seems strange to us. And it could have, you know, right, it could have actually have been, some people have drawn a picture of a, of a temple that kind of looked like a T, where you had a 90 foot by 90 foot, and then the back area there. Uh, I've seen some pictures like that. We really don't know for sure, just other than some very generic ideas. Yeah, I've got to put note of, as a comparison, over in 1 Kings 6, Solomon's temple was actually a little smaller. Yeah, yeah, and yet, and yet, you know, it's interesting that uh, I was like reading notes on Zerubbabel's temple, and they said it was bigger, and at first I thought that was a mistake, but it's interesting that whenever the people saw it, they were crying about it, you know, so I thought that was interesting to contrast the two, why why it sounds bigger, I don't know. And where's the ark? Do they still have it? Where is the ark? Uh, you know, Tasha, that's an important question. Where is the ark? And the answer, uh, Gregor? The Philistines took it. Well, we know the Philistines took it once, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Stephen? I read somewhere that uh, the Babylonian spring had to have a national There's a place in Egypt that's supposed to be in Jerusalem. That's true. That down in Ethiopia actually is a, one place where they claim it enough. So, so touch what the answer is. Uh, Anybody else have that right? I just wonder if the Egyptians took it. Uh, Shishak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's actually the guess those people make, is that they say that whenever Shishak came to the temple, he looted everything that was gold. And well, well, here's a tricky question. Was the ark gold? No, you're right. It was, it was acacia wood covered in gold. But remember the lid? The lid was solid gold. So... You know, it, it, some of it was solid gold, but the tip, but the ark itself, very good. It actually was wood that was just uh, covered in gold, in gold uh, 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 plate, uh, plate. Um, so that's interesting. So a lot of people think that what happened is Shishak, this is back in the time of Rehoboam, might have been the one to take it. Jeremiah says some things that makes us think that it wasn't there in his time. So, but really, nobody ever tells us that. Don't you think that would have been important? And yet, fascinatingly enough, there's never a specific reference to its disappearance. So it's a really interesting thing to, to ask a good question that we don't have a great answer to. Uh, the Hebrew writer kind of talks about the idea that those things were long gone in his time. So, you know, that's, uh, that's really the best we have. It's a good question. And it's an interesting question because, remember, the ark was part of worship. It was the place where the high priest went to get atonement. So what were they doing without an ark is an interesting question. And... I also think that um, if they knew where the ark was, if it still was here or something, what would, what would they be doing? They be worshiping. You know, and, and the same thing is that's the reason why nobody knows where Moses is buried. Yeah. You know, because if they knew, what would we be doing? If we if the ark was around, 
What would people be doing? Surely not, Anthony. You know, you're not saying something like if they, if, if uh, Moses puts a serpent on a stick that they'd serve worship that. So, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, what's interesting, Anthony, is I think it would be really tempting to get mixed up and start worshiping the ark when you were going in there all the time. <clears throat> and all the ark was was an ark of the covenant. Now, maybe maybe it's significant for us to consider the ark. ark what does the word ark mean? A box. Very good. It's just a box. The box of the covenant. What was in the covenant? What was in the box? The law and the manna and Aaron's rod. So you had... The, the promise of food, you remember the land is going to feed them. You had the law. Remember, a covenant is always two things, a law and a promise. So they're in that box. The, the, the life of Aaron's rock, God choosing them for the priesthood. So I think it's important to understand that the covenant box being taken symbolizes the idea that the covenant itself was in default. So that's kind of a neat way to think about that. So it's a good question, Todd, so I appreciate it. And uh, a lot of neat, uh, really neat comments. Uh, some of you brought up was really good. Uh, got me distracted. I just forgot where we were for a second. Um, so going back to the questions here, as we're talking about these things, um, what did the king instruct the governor? We didn't read this part, but uh, hopefully you had a chance to read uh, up through eight, verse 8. He gives them a series of instructions. Uh, verse 6, he gives seven, verse 7, he gives them. Verse 8, uh, and 9 and 10, verse 11. What did he tell them? What does he say starting off, Lamar? He's just saying, don't hinder the work. Yeah. The way that the work progresses. So the number one thing he says is, don't stop them from building. Number one. But he adds to the decree. He gives his own decrees. It's kind of interesting. Uh, what does he give a decree? Uh, what, what verse 8 does he say is going to happen next? You're going to help. <laughs> you, ever, you ever wonder if the governor thought, why did I ever write this one? Uh, I don't know. But, you know, he says, I need you to pay for this. I need you to pay for this. You're going to pay the cost uh, 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 from taxes. Now, by the way, it wasn't just saying, you know, hey, you're going to pay for it, not me. It's the king's taxes he's talking about. And he says, whatever they need, uh, you know, verse 9, not just money, but what? What are the things that he offered? Now, here's something interesting to think about. Um, he goes through this list. Now, to you and I, this list sounds pretty typical. But to maybe Persians or Greeks or Egyptians, this list is missing a lot of natural things to sacrifice. Because what else would you sacrifice? See children, children, yeah. You know, the Persians weren't known for that, but uh, kind of an interesting thing to think about. I was thinking animal wise. You know, they typically know when the archaeologists will know when they found an ancient Israel site versus somebody else because they'll find lots of pig bones. Swine were a pretty typical thing to be sacrificed. The Greeks did it, the Romans did it. No mention of those here. Uh, what other kind of creators? You know? Um, you know, the, the Egyptians sacrificed their cats and all sorts of things. What, what, what do we call those in the Bible, animals like that? <laughs> unclean. So here's what's interesting. No mention of any unclean. It doesn't say, hey, you know, whatever they want. It gives a specific list. So the question is, what do you think? How did he figure that out? What's going on? Is that a question? Wasn't Daniel still alive? Probably not. That's interesting. We don't know when Daniel dies, but Daniel lives up to the time of Cyrus. Now, this is about Cyrus's reign, and so this, what did we say this was? Uh, uh, what did you look at? About 50 years later. So, so 559 to 530. So, you know, uh, 559 would be about the time. So, yeah, what'd you say? What'd you say, Gregor? Yeah. Well, going by your math up there, it looks like. Because this was during the time of Xerxes, right? No, this is the time of Darius. So. Oh, it's still Darius? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what's that, about 30 years later? It's probably not. Probably not. You know, he would have been, well, he was he was in it probably close to 90 whenever Cyrus showed up. So. The reason I asked him because it seems to me that there would have been some Jews that would have been advisors to the kings or something. Yeah. Um, do we know of any Jews that were advisors to the king? Maybe the next king, Xerxes? Is he Mordecai. Mordecai. Yeah, 
important guy. Exactly, you said Bobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Daniel was a, was an advisor to the king. All right. Exactly. Exactly right. Uh, we know that Mordecai, a little further on, is going to be an advisor to the king too. Um, and go ahead. I was going to say, you know, there are still plenty of Jews over in the main area of Persia. So, you know, the king's writing this letter and he says, what are these Jews, what are these Jews actually want anyway? It wouldn't have been hard to go around and find out. In fact, the majority of Jews still live in that region. Because we said only about 50,000 went back, so the majority of the millions are still there. And that's what we get out of Esther and the next chapter. When we jump ahead 60 years, we're going to find Ezra's going to take back a whole group of people himself. So there's a lot of people, right? I wonder if some of the eunuchs were still Jewish at that time. Uh, that's an interesting question, Ryan. Uh, what do you think? What's your thought? Well, that would explain how they would know that the guy I described was writing in the eunuch. So, so when Ryan talks about eunuchs, um, we're talking about guys like Daniel that would have been magic, but also probably Nehemiah. In fact, going to the point that where it was brought up earlier that Nehemiah didn't go into the temple, why not? What did the law say about that? Because when Nehemiah tells him, like, no, he doesn't mind, like, can't sin. So it's interesting enough to say he couldn't go in even for that reason. Oh. I was going to say, I think some of the things that he was putting in, to some degree, that to take care of the Jews and what they would be interested in, and trying to appease their God, as I'm serious, seemed to be interested in whatever God he was serving. He wanted to make sure that they were happy and that their deity was happy. Yeah. But also, as we you know, look back at chapter one, and he returned the people to uh, the area. And then we get down to verse eleven. It says, "No uh, give sacrifices of sweet aroma to God of heaven, pray for the life of the king and the son." It's a little self-serving. Yeah, in some of what he's doing and what's motivating. I think that that verse is really interesting. You need them to get all of their worship in order so they can pray for us. And I, you know, I think it's great. I actually think that that's really probably one of the smartest things any ruler has ever done. Let me make sure your church is away well so you can pray for us. I tell you what, if our community knew that, uh, I think our uh, the, the city councilors would say, we'll buy the building for you if you'll just pray for our community, you know? Uh, and I think it's really fascinating that the king has a mindset that says, no, to do whatever they need, here it is, get them all their stuff, and, they, and they'll pray for us. And that's a really neat thing. Uh, that I see coming on here. You know, there's uh, an interesting story later on when Alexander the Great, the Greek, comes in and conquers the area, and he tells, the story goes, it's, it's not the Bible, so we don't know, but the story goes, he goes to the people in Jerusalem, and they say, you know, we can't submit to you because we're, we're submitting to the Persians. And the idea was, centuries later, they still held this a pretty serious uh, relationship, and I've always thought that's kind of an impressive thing, impressive thing. Um, King makes a statement. He says that this is the place where God uh, caused, verse 12, the God who causes his name to dwell there. That's an interesting expression. Why? Where have you heard that before? God makes that expression? Yes. That was actually the wording that God said way back in, I just forgot which one it was, Deuteronomy uh, or Numbers. Uh, way back in the law of Moses, God had said, we're going to have a place and I'm going to put my name there, and you're going to worship me there. That's uh, that's the statement. We're going to talk about this Sunday when we talk in John 4 uh, about worship. And the woman at the well say, hey, you, you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place to worship. And Jesus will acknowledge that that's accurate at that time. He says the time's coming. It's not. So the point was God had put something there in Jerusalem, that special place of worship. And it's really interesting that this Persian king knows that. He understands that idea. Um, and that it's, it's just a really fascinating thing to think about. George? Well, and David in his time also referenced that. David. And David is the fulfillment of that, right? Uh, David's the one that God says in First uh, Second Samuel 8, you know, that you're going to carry that, you know, that, well, you're going to help carry that out. Your son would actually carry that out. And, um, and by the way, George, when he says your son will build the temple, uh, who's he talking about? Solomon? Jesus. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, kind of interesting how it's a dual statement about what's going to happen with that. So that's a neat point. Uh, anybody else? 
So this, uh, this decree comes out, and the king gives a real interesting thing. If you don't do it, what? It's supposed to be taken from their house, and they're supposed to be impaled on it. What does that sound like? It sounds like you better do it as the king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. How would you feel if that was on your like the speed limit sign? Violator, it will be. Uh, you know, it's interesting. They say crucifixion actually goes back to before this to the Assyrians, and it, to me, that was one thing I kind of thought about. You know, if you don't do this, you know, it sounds almost like crucifixion being nailed to to the beam in your house. This is pretty serious. Um, this isn't a if you feel like doing it. This is an absolute do this. You know, so it's kind of interesting. You alter the edict, you're in trouble. Now, you're going to see 60 years later, there's going to be some problems. But for now, that's a pretty good statement to wrap things up with for them. So, the governor gets it. Uh, verse 13 says, and he did according to what the king had said. The elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet, Zechariah, the son of Edo. Uh, actually, here's a question for you real quick. When the Bible talks about the elders of Israel, what are we talking about? The elders of Israel. You know, of course, we have elders in the church. Same thing? You're right. No, it's not the same thing. Gregor? Uh, I think I remember the elders are often referred to as the heads of the families. Okay. Um, you know, so like the oldest male of a family would be the elder of that family. And he would be called upon to represent them in lots of things. Okay. And to take a That's a, 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 it's important to see that heads of families were often given that. And also yeah, called the leaders of the tribe. Leaders of the tribes? What was the specific office that Moses set up for the leaders of the tribes? We don't, they don't use the word much after Moses. Uh, but wasn't that so, was, um, handle all the daily Yes, yes, daily yes, the judges, yeah. yeah. So uh, so the, these are very possibly the connection to the judges. In the New Testament, what is, what is the word that describes their meeting, their committee? The word Sanhedrin is a reference to the elders of Israel. In fact, we see those two terms used synonymously. So, you know, it kind of gives us a sense who these people are. Um, is it exactly the office of judges that Moses set up? I've always wondered uh, just how directly they're connected. It might be, I'm not sure. Uh, but these people come together. How important is the role of Haggai and Zechariah in this? What do you think, George? The main event. The main event? If they weren't there, nothing would have gotten done. Now, that's interesting, George, and I wondered about that. George says if they weren't there, nothing would have gotten done. Uh, they had lost momentum. They would lost steam. Uh, remember what the prophet Haggai said? You could do this, but you didn't finish God. So what did he say? What could they do? What did they do but not do for God? They built their own house. Yeah, yeah, they built their own homes. But he said you didn't build the house of God. So, uh, George, I like your statement. I think that's good. You know, uh, they wouldn't have gotten anywhere without these guys showing up and prompting them. Even though it's Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, I've, I've sung their praises. I told you they're pretty great guys. These prophets had to show up and spur things back into motion. And I think that's an important point. Um, anybody have a, any other point about these two guys? Got one more prophet coming in the scriptures. Who's that? Malachi, yeah, and he'll probably come about the same time as Nehemiah, so we've still got a while to go before that time appears. So, uh, once they get everything in order there, how long does it take to finish it up? How long does it take on verse 15 to finish the temple? Stephen? Six years. It started in 536. 20 years, yeah, you could say it took them 20 years, or it could take them. You know, this, it talks about the sixth year of the reign of Darius, um, uh, but I like to think of the idea of the, uh, you know, 20 years worth of building in order to get to get the temple finished. So they've gotten the temple finished. And, uh, you know, what some of the questions were, I thought this was an interesting question. Well, describe what life was like for the Jews during this time period. What kinds of things were they doing? How were they living their lives? 
Yeah. What, George, what kind of things do you think they struggled with? The fruitfulness of their crops and so on and so forth. You know, it's kind of interesting, George. Uh, we could make a really interesting observation that, you know, when you have when when we have problems in life, you know, if the Israelites had said, hey, we're just not getting things, they might have said, well, we need to, you know, do better with our crops or things like that. When the solution is really put the things of God first. You know, how many times is that our life's problem? Where, you know, the, the problems in life that we struggle with, it really amounts to a, but if I just put God first, maybe those things will be resolved. We'll come back to that idea here in just a moment. A lot of times we'll, you know, we'll struggle a little and then we'll just put more effort into what we're already doing. Yeah. Then we struggle some more. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. There's that old saying, it's not true, but it's an old saying that, you know, insanity is defined by keeping and doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing to think about. But too often, we just kind of, whenever our problems are right in front of us, we, we kind of, you know, bear down on those problems. And instead of giving God the things that he desires and letting him bring solutions for us. So it's an important point. Like I said, we'll come back to that here in just a, just a moment or two. Anybody else have thought about what, what was their lives like? Stephen? I was going to say that uh, a lot of times we're told over and over throughout the scripture that the scriptures that uh, you know, we take the initiative and then God brings about the result. So we always have to take the initiative. Yes. And, yeah. You know, uh, Abraham you know, went to sacrifice Isaac. And then, and then God said, when you start doing this, yeah, yeah. But there's so many other instances. Yeah, yeah that's very good. I was thinking in Nehemiah, I remember it, that said that the governors laid burden on the people. So I think at various times there were just honest governors, even among the Jews. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it's interesting because what the very first governor brought in by the Babylonians was Jewish. And who killed him? Anybody remember? Well, the Jews actually did. So, you know, there's just, there was lots of. Uh, Lots of drama and problems there, too. So you're right about that. Of course, finally, the idea is, what kind of city is Jerusalem? It's a stalwart, you know, well-known international city. What kind of city? Not at this time. It was kind of belittled. It was it was broken down. And what's the big thing that it doesn't have? Walls. It doesn't have walls. And a city without walls is nothing. Yes, it, it's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But that's, you know, think about this. That's 60 years later. Um, and what's interesting to think about that is that means there was a whole generation that grew up in a Jerusalem that's a miserable place to live. Because when they come to Nehemiah and say, Nehemiah, won't believe what it's like. I mean, there's a whole generation of people that that's all they've ever known. A broken down city with a nice city. Yeah, you're, you're looking at Nehemiah fixing the wall in 52 days. And you're looking in, in Ezra taking them 20 years. And, and it seems to be about leadership. It seems to be yeah. about a purpose that God is trying to, it, it would be related to us in doing God's work. Uh, Nehemiah lit a fire or motivated him. Zerubbabel did too, but it was, they only got to the temple. And, and uh, the governors of the Samaritans would enter in and they would stop building. And Nehemiah wasn't, when you, when you get to Nehemiah, he doesn't. He doesn't fall for that. Yeah. He says, "I'm busy. I ain't coming to see you." I mean, they, they did. And you just look at the steps of what they tried to do to stop uh, doing God's work. Uh, and and I see a contrast between Ezra to Nehemiah. Barry, you're exactly right. And it's interesting to see that you know it's, it's these men that come in with. You know, and one of the things people love to talk about Nehemiah is they love to talk about Nehemiah in terms of leadership because there's vision, there's purpose, there's goals, uh, all these ideas that people love to describe in good leadership. And Nehemiah is just one of the best examples of quality leadership. Go ahead. The question is, is it referring, a lot of people will look at this referring only to the elders, but it seems that he's referring to every believer. And I think that's a very important point to know. Yes, we got leaders uh, in the church, 
but a lot of times the work is going to be done, or at least should be done, by normal believers or Christians. Uh, there's a lot of important things to think about with that, Barry. I really appreciate that, Frank. Okay. Um, second time, I think maybe we'll pass this over. Actually, just give me a quick answer. Uh, compare the two dedications. What's the difference? The dedication way back in First Kings when Solomon dedicates the temple versus now. Yeah, I mean, it was just incredibly different in size and, and how it's carried out. That's kind of, again, that's an interesting thing, but it also describes the circumstances, I think, too. It's worth considering the difference that's there. Um, finally, as it kind of wraps this up, uh, it talks about them keeping the Passover. Now, I told you that it's important to understand that the Old Testament gives us a picture that they weren't good about doing this. So this is important. Uh, who ate the Passover? Who kept the Passover? Everybody in the community, right? The exiles. The priests had purified themselves. And who else? What, what was the other half of it? As the priests purified themselves, and the verse 21, Israelites. Yeah. Because was the Passover for everybody? No. It's important. Um, it's important because one of the big themes, we've already hit it, we're going to keep hitting it throughout Ezra, and then into Nehemiah, is who do you have partnership with? You know, who is it that we're, you know, in this, uh, you know, in this, this, you know, work of worship with? Ezra and Nehemiah are an important story about the idea that, you know, it's not everybody that gets that privilege to worship. This is an important idea that we're going to come back to a lot more as we move forward. We've already seen it whenever Zerubbabel and Joshua wouldn't permit the Samaritans for participation in the building of the temple. So that's an important point. Um, I'll tell you what, we've only got about five minutes left, but I have a couple of comments here. Go ahead. So the, he describes the people who lived in the land um, as... Phil. Yeah. So, Phil of the nation. It wasn't just that, well, you know, they're good people and we just can't do this. They were just, they were actually the scum of the earth to begin with yep. because that's who came in and filled in the gap. But here's what I think is really strange about that term, built of the nation, you know, the built of the nation, is that that would include the Samaritans who were worshipers of God. So that's interesting. That these people that said, we worship God too, you know, we're worshipers of God, and yet they're being contrasted as, this isn't yours. George? Yeah. I really, you know, we, we, if we had more time, it'd be nice to spend a little more to talk about the, the purification, the ritual cleans, cleansing of these people. Very nice. We know in Nehemiah they sent a pro false prophet. Who would, who would, if he was a prophet, why would he tell someone to disobey a command of God? Yeah. I mean, they they did that to draw to draw Nehemiah out so they could kill him or dispose of him because of, they wanted to stop the building, but uh, or the work of God. But who would? You know, you, you got a, you got a prophet that's supposed to be legitimate. What? Why would he tell? Why would he tell Nehemiah to do something contrary to God's word? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Way back in what Deuteronomy thirteen, God says sometimes prophets are going to show up, and He says if they tell you to do something contrary to My word, this is a test. You know, He'll say you, you're you're being tested. If you don't disobey me. You know, great example of that. First Kings thirteen and our young prophet and old prophet. When the older prophet told him, no, God said it's okay, and the younger prophet listened, even though it was contrary to what God had said, he was punished for it. Um, let's, let's do some application. Uh, first thing that I want to talk about is, we already kind of made this point, but it's worth coming back to one more time. Uh, God's point was, what they needed to do when they got there was to rebuild the temple. They needed to take care of first things first. But they got distracted. Pretty soon they started, uh, we saw the prophets talking to them about this. They were saying, well, things aren't going well, and, and, and they lost sight of this. And the important thing that we want to think about, the idea 
that in life, there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to be put to the test to make decisions uh, that, that involve righteousness. And you might think, well, this doesn't seem like it's going to bring me closer to what I'm trying to get out of my life. If you put God first, God's with you. You know, I like to tell people like this. If you, if you walk with God, he's your friend. He's a friend with whom nothing is impossible. Too many times people say, well, you know, I, you know, if I do these things that God wants me to do, uh, I'll see the bad things that are going to happen to me. But if you're doing what God purposes you to do, God's with you. And the only success you're going to have in life is because God's going to give you success. I can't believe the Israelites didn't see it. Uh, but, but I don't see it. You know, I don't think of these things, and I forget how it is that God says, Brian, I want you to give me the first things of your life. And I think, oh, but if I give that to you, what am I going to have left over? I need these other things. And God said, no, if you just trust me, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, what was the rest of what Jesus said? All these things are provided. God says, I'm going to be first. I'm going to be first. Not, not your work, not, not your family, not all the things that you're after. Put me first, and then all these things, I'm with you. So I think one of the best lessons we walk away here is to be reminded, put God first. Anybody have any uh, uh, things to add to that? Second point. How important is this? Um, I, w I wish we even had more time to talk about this, but what is the temple today? Us. We're in the temple, 1 Corinthians 6, and you said it. The church, 1 Corinthians 3. And that's the real temple, by the way. This temple that Zerubbabel built, Solomon built, that was just a shadow of the reality of the temple that Jesus built, that is the church. And it's important, the book of Hebrews says that the, that the it talks about the tabernacle, but the temple too. And he says these things were just patterns of the real heavenly things, of the divine relationship to God. There's a lot of things we can say about the temple. We can talk about the temple that is your body. If you desecrate the temple, what does that do to your worship? Makes it in vain, right? It makes, well, God actually says offensive. So we have these statements where God says things like, you know, I'm not, you know, if you're a sinner, your worship's no good. It has to do with the temple. And ideas about the temple, and how the temple is established, and how it's founded, and, and who pays for it, and, and things like that. This is all interwoven throughout the whole Old Testament just to get us to a point to say, number one, the church, that is the temple of God, what pays for it? Next point. The blood of Christ pays for it. He establishes it. It's built with living stones. What are the living stones? Peter chapter 2 says, we're the living stones. Yeah. There's a lot of things to think about when you talk about the temple in the Old Testament. But the biggest ideas all are the ones that foreshadow what we see in the church. Last point. You're John 4 coming up that you're going to talk about this next week. Yeah. It's exactly in that point. Yes, it is. The question was, where do you worship? Over here or over there? He said, time's coming and you work in spirit and truth. Lord, that implies that the worship is going on inside the individual. Romans 12, chapter, verse 1. We are the sacrifice that is supposed to be. God, God demands uh, human sacrifice. It's just a living sacrifice. And it's so many years. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the whole point of John 4, and you've got to think that woman had to be shocked. I, yeah, I'll save some of this for Sunday, but you, she had to be shocked when he said, well, let me tell you the real thing. It doesn't matter. That the time is coming that it's not going to be a place that worships. You're the temple of God. So, but the idea is the temple is important. One last thing, though, we're on a little past our time. Uh, the importance of worship, uh, they're partaking in the Passover, they're partaking in worship. Again, Sunday we're going to talk about worship, and we're going to make the point to say that the Passover was a foreshadow of, of Christ. But for us, we use the Lord's Supper to look back at the same thing that the Passover was a foreshadow too. So in that sense, they have a neat connection for us to think about. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Make some great comments and thoughts tonight. I really appreciate it.
Thank you. 